I think that what, what happened in the 1980s and the 1990s was a sense that too many people were being left behind. And of course, the political process responds. Now, how do you help people whose incomes aren't growing? Well, you try and retrain them, you try and educate them, but that's really difficult, uh, and it takes a long time. The next possible alternative was credit, and that's often the alternative found in developing countries. By giving people who are falling behind easy credit, you allow them to consume. And after all, consumption matters as much, if not more, than incomes. And if you also give them a house, housing credit, uh, you know, maybe they look at the house price, see it increase, feel themselves better off, are allowed to borrow against that house price to fund consumption. And the fact that the incomes are stagnating doesn't matter so much. I argue that housing credit and the push towards low-income housing credit was a palliative, a way to take people's attention off the deeper problem that incomes were stagnating, and it worked. Mm -hmm. It worked for the Republicans, it created more homeowners who typically tend to vote Republican. It worked for the Democrats. It created uh, sort of more uh, sort of flows towards their natural constituency. Both supported it in a big way. President Clinton through affordable housing initiatives, President Bush through what he called the Ownership Society. Tons of money was poured into low-income uh, um, lending uh, by various quasi-government agencies and government agencies. And to my mind, that helped the process of creating what we've now got, which is a unholy mess in the housing sector. But when it's all about jobs, the kinds of policies that are undertaken can be extreme and may not have the intent if the, if the corporations aren't hiring, but you're pushing very hard on every button that you have, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, job owning, everything you're doing, sometimes that can go in the wrong direction. You find that many people within the banks understood fully well what was going on and yet they went along. The push towards low-income housing, the extreme degree of stimulus given by the Fed, the willingness to intervene if the system got into trouble, uh, and the flows coming in from outside, all of them combined essentially to give the financial system the incentive, which was primarily of the kind, if we bet and take more risk, we make tons of money. If we lose, somebody else will pick up the pieces. And what I argue is in 2002, 2003, 2004, the Fed, was on hold, kept interest rates really, really low because it was worried that jobs weren't coming back. What's happened since 1991 is we've had what are called jobless recoveries. It took 23 months for the jobs lost in the recession to come back in 1991. It took 38 months, three and a quarter years, for the jobs to come back in 2001. By most estimates, this current recession, it'll take longer than three and a quarter years, maybe five years. Well, if you think about it that way, What's six months of unemployment benefits when you're looking at five years' worth of unemployment? Unemployment benefits uh, expire after six months. Most people have health care benefits tied to jobs until the recent uh, bill, and that's not going to kick in for another four or five years. Uh, so the real problem is that people who lose their jobs have tremendous amounts of anxiety because, you know, coupled with the low savings, uh, they really have nothing to fall back on. That's why I argue Maybe we ought to think about extending the safety net to something which makes more sense, given the nature of recoveries has changed, because that will allow for calmer, more sensible policies. There are concerns that a lack of leadership and competing economic interests have left the global economy as vulnerable as ever. We have rules against subsidies, for instance, uh, yet the United States continues to subsidize its farmers at the expense of farmers in the developing world. That there is a narrative that the United States talks about in terms of we need a level playing field so with rule of law and transparency. A a but a lot of folks in the emerging market world say, wait a second, you you've, str you've created globalization over the last 40 years with rules that you created that benefit Western-based multinational corporations. They've been reaching out. They've taken our labor. They've taken our goods. They've made the bulk of the profits. And now that we're coming into our own, and our own corporations are doing much better. We're trying to use our legal system to, with our sorts of rules so that that playing field will start to shift in our favor. You're saying you don't like it. Now, at least, you know, in Europe, you've got a crisis right now, but people are being honest 
that the economics have become zero sum. There's divergence, not convergence, and either the Germans and French are going to pay or the Greeks, the Spaniards, and the Portuguese are going to pay, but it's zero sum. The pie is only so big, someone has to pay. Between the West and the developing world, there is a rebalancing that is occurring. You've had convergence, you're moving towards divergence, but instead we're talking about the G20, we're talking about win-win. That, that we need to be honest with ourselves that we are in a more zero-sum economic environment. We need to be honest that we're in a G0. Let's set expectations realistically so we can actually build from a reasonable base. International oil corporations used to be able to go to a dictator, cut a nice deal with them, throw them some millions of dollars, put a straw on the land, and take cash out. Just suck cash right out of the country. It worked very well for them until the dictators realized that they could create their own straws. National oil corporations, now 13 of the 15 largest oil corporations in terms of reserve size. They are not companies in the private sector. They are national oil corporations. When we talk about big oil, we're really talking about states, as it turns out, right? So if you were an IOC, you suddenly were out of the straw business. And that meant that you had to either do something different, like move towards management and technology, one of the things that ExxonMobil has successfully done, or you lose. Failure is an option, right? And I think that what Western multinationals investing in China, Steve Ballmer among them, and probably Goldman Sachs soon, are going to have to realize that the old way of doing business is going to put them directly in confrontation with the state. So they're going to have to adapt or they're going to lose. And some of them will adapt. Some of them will lose. Uh, and I don't think we're quite, um, we're quite conscious of that yet. My argument is that what we saw then with oil, we are now seeing in many sectors, in a aviation, in technology, in telecom. So we're getting State capitalism itself in this manifestation is pretty new um, in the way that it's using these tools of the free market. But there's no question that it had its origins in mercantilism, um, 18th and 19th centuries, um, where you did have effective unity between states and a lot of key corporate actors, the, you know, sort of the, the, uh, this, the East India Company, trading company, for example, which basically operated as an arm uh, of government um, and, and, and took advantage of investment opportunities um, for, in, that, in that way. Now, they didn't, people didn't think about free trade, uh, and they certainly didn't have free currency flows in the way that you do today. So mercantilism was really a very early precursor mm -hmm. of the state capitalism we have right now. But there's no question that you see that happening. What distinguishes uh, state, cal state capitalism from mercantilism? Well, I, again, I think the big difference is that you have governments now that are actually actively using pricing mechanisms and tools of contemporary markets, of globalized sure. markets, for their own political outcomes. The economic conflict is increasingly what security is all about. I mean, when you have cyber espionage that's being supported by governments uh, going after the, um, the, 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 the corporate uh, secrets uh, um, and technology, whether you're talking about uh, big oil and gas firms, whether you're talking about technology firms, whether you're talking about Google, uh, that, that is increasingly hitting at the heart of the vitality of these countries. The Chinese increasingly don't need the West the way they did before. They used to need foreign direct investment dollars. They don't anymore. They have the investment. They used to need Western technology. They've stolen and developed a lot of that. And the West doesn't want to bring in a lot of what they have brought in the past because they're losing it. And in addition to all of that, you have um, the Chinese recognizing that they cannot count on the West to consume their exports the way they used to. So the Chinese want to decouple. It's going to take a long time, but that's the strategy. And so between the United States and China, the world's two largest economies, there is actually a war between state capitalism and the free market. The systems are fundamentally incompatible. In China fact, America is a joke. It's a joke. Um, no one ever should have talked about a G2. Um, it is uh, a system where there are some zero-sum components and there are some positive-sum components, but in the last 18 months, the zero-sum components have become more important. And on every major issue, whether we're talking about Iran or Taiwan or the Dalai Lama or currency or cybersecurity or trade or intellectual property or the environment, on every single one, the U.S.-China relationship is in worse shape than it was two years ago, and it's deteriorating. 
in the case of the relationship between the U.S. and China, if China fails, we have serious problems. And yet, if they really succeed with the system, we have serious problems. So this is a very tough one to manage. The world as a whole over the last 40 years had been governed by an increasingly global free market system. That was the dominant economic paradigm. Mm. We've hit the tipping point on that. There is now a competing system. It's real. Uh, it's state capitalism. It's a system where the state is the principal actor in the economy, it uses the markets for ultimately political gains, and there's no rule of law. If there is a war between the state and the corporation, the corporation loses. You're flagging China that it could experience some instability as it opens up. More than some. Do you do you still believe that? Of course. When but is it, when is but it the happen? point the point Besides is besides the ten thousand in or the last two protests. years they've stopped opening up. The Chinese government had been incrementally opening their economy over the past 20, 30 years, but not once the economic crisis hit. And we need to recognize that we've now given them the ability not just for Hayafe to talk to me, but for the Chinese government to tell their people we can't support. Look what happened with the free market. It's America's fault. And all these, all these free market capitalists that the economy is in the situation that it is, right? So it's a coping mechanism. We've really set, in other words, if you had believed that there was a possibility that the Chinese model was maybe unsustainable in five to ten years, if you believed that two years ago, you better be pushing that back now mm. because they've just given themselves an extraordinary lease on life. Do I believe that the West is going to engage in more economic populism, nationalism as a response? to a structural change in who has access and availability to wealth and consumption capacity. Yes, I do. A world where the emerging markets are going to start doing most of the consuming and most of the growth is a world that will be fundamentally more conflict-laden, more violent, less ethical. There are implications of that. There are many countries that if you were to put a democratic system in place, it would be much, much worse for that country. Think about the elections that we've just had in Afghanistan. Never should have happened. The country was not ready for democracy. Smart governance in that country would have told you don't have democratic elections. I believe that a properly regulated free market economy, properly regulated, not what we've seen in the last few years, is the most effective, or at least worst, economic system that the world has seen. And yet, if you take that system and you suddenly put it into a country that is authoritarian, mm -hmm. that has state capitalism, you could do extraordinary damage to that country's stability and globally. It is probably mm -hmm. right for the Chinese officials not to want to move quickly to a free market economy today. And I hate to say it, but it may even be right for the United States to support that. In a state capitalist society, right, the government wants to have as much growth as possible. And they also want political stability. But when they're forced to choose, they choose political stability. That is important to recognize. In Abu Dhabi today, you have sovereign wealth funds. They are not trying to maximize returns. They were before the crisis. Now, they're much more economically constrained, and they have this massive problem in Dubai. And it doesn't make a difference what kind of returns they make. They're putting their money in Dubai first. Mm. If you're China, you must secure commodities all over the world for your people and your growth. And it doesn't matter if it's an authoritarian state. And it doesn't matter if that's maybe not the most rational, efficient use of that, of that currency today and those surpluses today, because you understand that you need that or you're going to have serious political problems domestically. So as you find that things are constrained, that you have to make choices, that you have priorities, the Chinese care enormously about environmental degradation. They do. It's a priority. They want to move to alternative energy. They're doing it. But the priority is economic growth. More than that. Why? Because the priority is political stability that requires that growth. That growth has to happen every year, every quarter. And so as a consequence, they're continuing to engage in this extraordinary degradation of their environment. All of these things create unsustainability over the long term. But it's the long term. In a country with 1.3 billion people, with extraordinary capacity to continue to leverage the productive capacity of those people, 
much more than any other country in the world today, they can make a lot of mistakes and they can be less efficient and they can still grow quite a bit.